From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger Morris. It's Wednesday, June 28th. It's been called the greatest threat to democracy. Indeed, a force so powerful it could spark the end of human civilization as we know it. We're talking about artificial intelligence. Many people are, understandably, frightened. How could they not be when even some pioneers in the field have rung the alarm bells themselves? No less than Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple, and Elon Musk recently called for a moratorium on the development of the most sophisticated AI systems. This was only shortly after an AI-powered chatbot urged one journalist to leave his wife in February this year. But what exactly is AI in reality? And is it all bad? Today, technology writer Tim Biggs on the upsides to artificial intelligence and how it's already deeply embedded in our everyday lives and what we should be worried about. So, Tim, news about artificial intelligence has been almost nonstop, it seems, for the past year or so. And largely, it seems that people are freaking out. And one of the biggest fears revolves around job loss. So can you tell us about some of the recent companies who've announced layoffs or that they're replacing staff or plan to replace staff with AI and perhaps companies who've already done so? Sure. I mean, fears of artificial intelligence taking our jobs or or worse have been around for, for a very long time. And I think it's important context to realize that those fears, you know, engender these discussions. So the freaking out isn't solely because of the reality, but I guess what what could be to come. But yes, there have been some instances already where job losses have been put down to AI. Artificial intelligence could replace millions of jobs. That's right. And the AI German paper Build announcing that it will be replacing many of its editorial jobs with artificial intelligence. Yeah. And the German newspaper Build had a restructure recently that involved around 200 job losses. Staff recently, bosses say they'll be laying off those in roles like editors, proofreaders, and photo editors, saying that these jobs, uh, for now and in the future, can easily be done by AI. Perhaps it wasn't actually firing any reports or authors or specialist editors, but it, it does seem to think it can do away with a lot of those supporting roles. And I guess the new hot thing in AI is um, these large language models that can create text that sounds as though it was written by a human. And so you can see how that would be handy if you're writing a script. With the rise of AI tools like ChatGPT, stories can be crafted in a matter of seconds. You could use it, for example, to do a first draft or to fill in a couple of extra pages um, if you needed to flesh things out or to, to edit or to do a whole bunch of things that would usually take people a lot of time. And I think, understandably, writers are concerned that the company could just see that as a cheap alternative um, and, and sort of stop using, stop using humans. Among the Guild's list of demands, regulation for using artificial intelligence and a standard for working in streaming. The AMPTP, which represents... Okay, so we've spoken a little bit about, you know, why people have legitimate concerns that they, they could lose their jobs. But what can't AI do? Is there an argument to be made that AI will just make some tasks more efficient and leave people to still keep their jobs, but perhaps just free them up to do other more sophisticated or demanding tasks? Sure. I mean, most AI that we have today is best at repetitive and predictable tasks. Like if you look at my job, for example, you might say that it's a creative job, but AI could still fit into it um, by, you know, writing headlines or automatically writing captions for images or sourcing images that we already have on file, doing all those sort of little things and leaving me to just focus on the, the creative side of things. Or like to take another example, if I was making an article that compared two smartphones together, smartphones that came out last year, uh, an AI would be very good at doing that because all the information is already out there. But that information has been written by me or by other tech writers previously. So it's not so much you know, creating it. It doesn't have its own human experience to draw on to make journalism out of. It can only sort of take it from other people. So you know, that's going to be a fundamental limitation, but it can sort of make people's jobs a lot more efficient. And to go back to the previous point, it's not hard to predict that 
you know, a lot of businesses would see that efficiency and say, hey, we could do the same job with one human instead of two humans now that they're more efficient. So I guess that's a double-edged sword there. Right. Okay. But you've written just over the weekend uh, quite a different take, I think, from what we've been reading a lot to all this panic over AI. Notably, you've written that most of the AI that we currently use is actually innocuous. And actually, we're all using it every day. It brings ease to our lives. We just don't know about it. So can you tell me about how AI has already infiltrated our lives and in what way? Yeah, so a lot of the talk at the moment, I guess, is informed by um, chat GPT and other technologies that are powered by large language models. Um, because that's something that I think has surprised people um, and changed a lot in a short amount of time. But over the last decade or so, there's been a lot of different forms of things that we now call AI, things like, you know, anytime you're using Google Maps to navigate, maybe you're in the car, it's deciding which way you're going to turn based on all sorts of uh, algorithms, based on how congested the road is, based on the information you've given it. If you use a phone, basically everything in there is AI, right? If you're taking photos, it's using algorithms to sharpen, to enhance, to completely invent details and colors in a lot of examples. If you're watching Netflix, it's using AI to decide what to promote to you. It's using algorithms to decide what images to show you in its advertisements. We're on the cusp of things like self-driving vehicles, which obviously use a lot of AI, drone deliveries, which we're seeing in certain parts of Australia use a, a lot of machine learning and algorithms to decide, you know, the best way to get to places. I guess part of the problem that we're having with AI and its image problem is that so many different forms of technology are all called AI. So we can have, you know, a lot of concerns about one or the other, but at the end of the day, we sort of group them all together and say, I don't know about this AI stuff. It seems to be a, have a lot of challenge and a lot of problems and maybe we should just do without it. But actually, you know, most of the use cases that we have so far and that we can see in the near future, I think, um, don't have those big sort of world ending ramifications. They just have, you know, a lot of efficiency gains and a lot of productivity. Right. Okay. so do you think the promise of AI and how it actually enhances our lives and how it can perhaps continue to enhance our lives has been lost in all of the sort of fearful headlines and articles? Yeah, I think there are a lot of opportunities and, and, you know, positive stories to be told. And I think it's, you know, it's partially human nature, I guess, to go to that worst case scenario. It's like we hear a lot about how scams and cyber criminals, you know, they'll also get more efficient. They'll also get worse as a result of AI. But, you know, if you told someone from 10 years ago, you know, there's this technology that we, I can write in any language and it can translate it to any other language. And it's not just a translation, but it can go in and it can, you know, make sure that the meaning and the tone is intact. It can sort of translate these references instantly. You'd say, wow, that's amazing. And when we get it now, we say, wow, scam artists are really going to use this to, to scam us really efficiently. So I think it's, it's a perspective of, of negativity. And I think that's informed partly by the fact that there are legitimate concerns like, you know, changes to the job market. Um, and also we have a history of, uh, you know, AI um, horror stories in, in popular culture and in academia as well that, you know, we draw upon when we're understanding AI because it's so early, we don't really have that understanding from the technology itself. Okay, so what do you then make of the people who've actually created AI systems who have themselves released panic statements saying that this technology has already got out of control, it already poses a risk? Because there have been a number of them who have sounded the alarm bells. There was the Google software engineer Blake Lemoyne who was fired by his company last year after he claimed that an unreleased AI system had become um, sentient. Google has a policy against creating sentient AI. And in fact, when I informed them that I think they had created Sentient AI, they said, no, that's not possible. We have a policy against that. So let's talk about what Google And then last month, Jeffrey Hinton, the so-called godfather of AI, quit Google so he could speak honestly about the dangers of it. Right now, they're not more intelligent than us, as far as I can tell. Um, but I think they soon may be. So we need to worry about that. And, that's how these and then in March this year, more than a thousand tech leaders and researchers and other people, including Elon Musk and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, signed an open letter urging a moratorium on the development of the most powerful AI systems. 
They've called for a pause in advanced AI development until shared safety rules for it are developed, implemented and audited by independent experts. The letter said... Power- so what do you make of all that? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot to, to break down in there. I guess part of it feeds into what we were just talking about, you know, about the most negative and most sensational and most familiar um, stories on AI kind of floating to the top and becoming part of the conversation. Obviously, any time uh, a researcher says that AI might kill humanity, it becomes, you know, 4,000 stories on the internet that get served to everybody. So it becomes this sort of outsized influence. And, and with things like, you know, Blake Lemoyne um, saying that these things have become sentient, partially that's that's also about you know, these negative experiences rising to the top when most people have completely pleasant or non-remarkable interactions with that technology. And part of it is because this is new early technology, right? It's designed to, it's not designed to trick people, but it's designed to make people feel as though they're talking to a person. And I think it's understandable that for certain people, that is really affecting and upsetting. And that's something that we're going to have to contend with as we continue to develop that you know, technology. I think we we do need to listen to people like Jeffrey Hinton who have legitimate concerns. And I think, you know, that's going to feed into a lot of regulation and a lot of ways we think about, um, you know, limiting AI and making sure that, you know, people aren't harmed by it. But I do definitely think that uh, those sort of comments play an outsized role in our understanding of AI day to day. There's no real stories of you know, people coming forward and saying, you know, I love this. It's made my job so much better. But that's definitely happening. But people, of course, do have legitimate concerns. You know, we hear about Amazon using a recruiting AI tool that didn't like women. You know, it had a system designed to rate the top five applicants it received out of 100 resumes. You know, it was it was mostly sort of picking up men because it was it was trained to vet applicants by observing patterns and resumes that the company had received over a 10 year period. And most of those came from men. So what legitimate concerns do you think people have that, you know, really are fair? Yeah, that that story of an algorithm sort of enforcing biases that that is held in its training data is I think is really common, Um, at least historically. There was a Microsoft example as well where you know, it's learning from the internet uh, all these sort of values um, and it's picking up, you know, the worst things and and amplifying them. And that comes down to, you know, things like um, sexism, but also things like racism and things like biases that we have with people from certain backgrounds um, or people from, you know, certain countries. So absolutely, that's a legitimate concern. And there needs to be, I guess, you know, protections in place to make sure that algorithm training data doesn't have those sort of, um, you know, biases or has something to account for those sort of biases. And I know, you know, that in itself is controversial because Elon Musk and several others have characterized that as teaching AIs, you know, to lie. They think that those biases should be included because that reflects the real world, which, you know, I personally think is nonsense, but I think that's a discussion that we're going to have to have. And there's other, you know, challenges as well, where we talked about the writer's strike. If you're using algorithms to create creative content, um, you know, that's all well and good. You might say, you know, this person's choosing an AI over a human because it's cheaper and it's, it's less quality, but, you know, that's their choice. But if that algorithm is based on the work of the human creator and the human creator is not being compensated for that, then that's a problem. That's basically plagiarism. And I think a lot of these issues of people using AI images and videos and writing is going to be, you know, roadblocked a little bit when big companies cotton on to the fact that, hey, we're creating news and we're expecting people to pay for it. And this other company is just leeching that content away with its AI and presenting it as its own. You know, that's sort of Uh, not really going to fly, I think, once the regulation starts moving. Okay. And so moving to that point on regulation and how we might manage this, we've heard a lot of times that the key to this, of course, is regulating AI before it regulates us, so to speak. And there's lots of ideas thrown around right now, for instance, making it mandatory for AI to disclose that, in fact, 
is AI, perhaps with automated text or an advertisement. This month, the Albanese government released a safe and responsible AI discussion paper seeking to impose regulation just like this and set up various monitoring processes. So this is promising, but what are the limits to regulating so many different forms of AI? Yeah, so regulation is obviously uh, needed. And I think, again, a lot of the current discussions are around, um, you know, things like ChatGPT and and large language models. And I think there the learnings are going to come from social media. Um, You know, in in that case, regulation happened a bit too late and they didn't seem to understand exactly what social media was doing. And to a large extent, the people creating the social media systems were able to say anything they wanted and and get away with anything they wanted. And we ended up with a system where, you know, people are being harmed by social media, people are being tricked by it. Uh, Users and media companies alike were sort of fooled into thinking that this was going to be the future of how people, um, you know, communicated. And that was done using all sorts of, you know, bogus data. The, The regulation sort of didn't protect a lot of people in that case. And so I think it's about understanding how these technologies are looking to be applied, whether there's any you know potential harms there and identifying situations that we just aren't ready to go to yet. And I think one of the big limitations is going to be that we can regulate as much as we want, but we're limited in the degree to which we can stop an autocratic nation or some other country um, you know, using AI against their own people or using AI to, um, I guess, make their war machines more efficient or to develop new weapons or to sort of move in a direction that, um, you know, we in the West are not necessarily willing to move. How nice to end on such a hopeful note, Tim <laughs> Biggs. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. No worries. Thank you very much. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Margaret Gordon. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.